So welcome um, to our side event, which uh, is called Health as a Driver for Climate Policy and Green Behavior. I'm very happy to welcome you on behalf of Souvent Le Climat, um, Save the Climate, an NGO from France, and Heidelberg University, especially the um, Institute of Public Health. So um, health has been, uh, in 2009, there has been a special commission on climate change and health by The Lancet, one of the most known medical journals. And there they said that health is probably the greatest health challenge, um, sorry, climate change is the greatest health challenge in the 21st century. Now, I think a lot of people um, have acknowledged this um, because there are a lot of health risks from climate change, including effects like death from heat waves, but also um, communicable diseases such as dengue fever and malaria, um, and a lot of other impacts on health. But then in 2015, The Lancet actually said that health is also the greatest health opportunity in the 21st century. And I think this is a some way that this research has traveled and today we rather want to focus on the health opportunities in climate change um, and if i can run you through our program very quickly first of all we will have professor Rainer sauerborn who will talk um, to us about the eight roles of health in climate policy but also in um, green behavior from individuals and then we will actually hear um, how we should communicate this role of health, because maybe some of you have heard Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger um, just a few hours ago saying that the communication of climate change is one of the key issues um, we need to get better in. After that, uh, we will have one talk which rather focuses on Indus, maybe industrial policy and where here health comes in, whereas in the following talks we will um, hear about um, the households and the individuals and how health is important in uh, this area. And I must say I've been a few days on the COP and I've heard a lot of very inspiring talks and events, but the role of how we behave be behave ourselves, especially um, in high-income countries, and how um, individuals affect climate change has really not been uh, talked about very much. So this is what we will talk about towards the end of this session. And then I hope that we will have maybe half an hour left for questions and discussions. So now I would like to um, give the floor to Professor Rainer Sauerborn. He is senior professor at the Institute of Public Health in, uh, at Heidelberg University, and he's also a visiting professor at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Rainer. Thank you very much, Arlene. Alina. Thank you very much. I'm very uh, pleased that uh, so many uh, have come at this late hour. Thank you very much for your interest. Uh, we want to start right away, so I push this button and it works. Um, there are just a little overview. Why is health important? Everybody now, we had a whole day of health and climate change. Everybody talks about health and I want to run you through why this is so. I'm a health person uh, by training, but then I've uh, shifted into climate change and health. Um, so how we frame things matter. Um, let me run you through this. Um, physics, you can talk about climate change as physics. PPMs, you can see level rise. You can talk about this uh, in terms of economics. You can talk about it in uh, threats for animals, the famous polar bears. You can talk about it as an apocalypse for uh, mankind. Equity, a poverty issue, further impoverishment, uh, time preference is uh, many people think it's very far away, as we heard very often today. And why should I bother today? And it's just something in 20 or 30 years. Uh, why should I take costs now to get benefits or avoid harm later? 
And, but health, is my point, would be one of the very favorable framing issues. If you want to have a positive message, Alina alluded to this, and if you want to get, how Schwarzenegger uh, said, to the heart of people, and this is not about an abstract thing like climate change, it's probably best or uh, to, to use health because everybody's concerned about their and their kids' health. Another thing is, uh, we, if you hear, if you go to um, TV, you see um, when it comes to climate change, you see chimneys with smokestacks, you see cars emitting. Uh, so the current approach of measuring emissions is a production, uh, very production focused uh, um, approach and not a consumption focus. So what we as households, if, if I eat something or if I buy something, it has a carbon footprint, but it is not really accounted for in the way the UNFCCC um, uh, accounts for the carbon footprint of a nation, for example. Um, so many, many papers in many countries, particularly the Scandinavian ones, have, have urged to use, also to add to this, a consumption approach. So that if we change our behavior, it's about consumption most of the time. It's consumption in mobility, in food, in housing, what we do to our windows and so forth, and, uh, and what we buy. And to, I'm coming to health, don't worry. Um, so this is a, a paper from a Norwegian colleague, Carlo Al, and uh, just uh, to show you that on the right-hand side, you see the UNFCCC uh, carbon footprint of Norway. In the middle, you add to this the, the consumption that Norwegians uh, engaging, which comes with a carbon footprint because they import something and so forth. Um, and then the, on the right hand side, I have a tough time reading this. Uh, from here, okay. Uh, and from the, in, in the right column is only consumption. And now comes, this is the red thing, it's only consumption. It is uh, roughly as much as the production one on the right hand side is uh, amounting to. So you see it matters. Uh, the way you count emissions matters. The way you frame climate change method matters. This is why I want to give you this little introduction into our panel. Now, uh, I talked to the uh, climate minister of Norway who was at the panel with uh, after Schwarzenegger um, and I said, you, you positioned your country as a, a very good example of climate policy, but this is what your exports, namely fossil fuels, uh, cause in terms of consumption in other countries. So it all depends on how you measure things. The message, the take home message of this slide, which I find baffling, is consumption matters and where you allocated to? Is it in the country of origin or in the country where it's consumed? Anyways, uh, and that also changes. Uh, the UK, Norway, Sweden and, and Denmark have done such an analysis. What if you measure our carbon footprint as a nation in terms of production? And you see here the blue ones, great, in the last 15 or 15, 10 years, we reduce our carbon footprint by 12 versus um, 11%. But if you look at uh, consumption, we increased our carbon footprint. Okay, this is not a talk about how to measure uh, best the carbon footprint, but just to tell you, if you don't take into account uh, current consumption, you get a completely different uh, success also. Okay, now quickly, the eight roles, that was the title of my talk. What are the eight roles? Why health matters? Everybody now seems to talk about health. I'm very happy. The first is health is a motivator. That's what Arnie, I could say, called, say Arnie uh, said today. That's what the governor of uh, California said. Um, it is a motivator. You have to get to people's hearts. And the second one is you, you solve in some some aspects you solve the problem of time preference. Usually you get the reap the benefits of uh, climate action in 20 or 30 years. But if you walk instead of driving your car, if you eat less red meat, you, your health benefits accrue to you immediately. That solves the problem of why should I do something if the health benefits or any benefits are distant. Yeah, health is a victim. We heard about uh, 
droughts, about malaria, and I don't want to get into this. There are many, about 84 diseases are climate sensitive. Uh, so health is a victim, health is a protector. The health system, we heard about this, can help you protect or predict problems, and so you can allocate resources. That's the health services can act, yes. It is a threat to economic growth in that if you, you cannot work full throttle outside anymore in many countries because it's just too hot. It's from human physiology. Health is a perpetrator. I mean, it's, I just tried to be, to be a little bit catchy here. It's a perpetrator in that the health services, Andy Haynes just said that in the other room, uh, emits between 3% in the UK and 7% in the USA of the total footprint. That's non-negligible. Uh, evidence creator, yeah, we publish sometimes, and we, we try to push evidence into the policy debate. And the eighth point I added recently, it's doctors are, I'm a pediatrician by training, as I said, doctors are used to uh, caring about risk factors. If you have a stroke, the patient uh, is smoking, has high blood pressure, is old, uh, is male, and, and, but you don't want to say why he had, you, don't, you want to tell him stop smoking and, and control your blood pressure. I cannot tell you which exactly was the cause for your stroke, but that's not important. So this issue of attribution, how many climate events lead to, to this, was it climate or was it poverty or was it uh, the vector or was it... It is an, an, an risk factor which is added to the existing risk factors. So we need to do something about it. Okay. So these are, and we are talking about these two today. That means how can we motivate people? How can we um, tell them that it is good for your health if you do something for climate? And this is why the chapter of the IPCC is called, for the first time, we add co benefits impact, adaptation, and co-benefits. So it's a development also in the IPCC that this is important. So what are these health co-benefits? And now we have to differentiate. There are benefits. I'm a public health person now, so I care for the entire population. I mean, it's a little bit bombastic. That's my focus. <laughs> I no longer care for the individual patient. That's the difference. That's medicine. Okay, so the benefits for the entire population is, for example, if you decarbonize energy systems, no coal and so forth, you get fewer heart, circulation, and lung health problems. We heard about the mind-boggling uh, numbers uh, today. It's several million deaths due to, uh, due to uh, our carbon, our fuel, uh, fossil fuel-based um, uh, energy systems. If you create climate-friendly cities, build environment, you get less heat stress, lung and mental health is improved. So the green, of course, is the health benefit here. These accrue to entire populations. And you might say, well, that's the free ride problem if I do something, or if something happens, maybe I don't benefit. And now comes the important thing. There are benefits that accrue or that go to you directly. If I do something, I get the health benefit. And that's so important in communication because you have a, an immediate benefit now or next year, not in 50 years. If you, if we can tell or help this lady to cook, and she does it already, on an improved stove instead of the, the three stone, that lady will get healthier. The children in the, in the womb of this lady will have a decent birth weight. And their kids who are carried on the back maybe will not inhale these toxic. So this accrues to the individual who changes the behavior. That's very important. If you promote physical activity that's more in the, in the richer part of the world, you, have, you stay fit and slim, mental health is improved, less diabetes. If you uh, eat less red meat, colon health, if that's a new term, but you don't have uh, uh, any risk or any increased risk of colon cancer, uh, and it helps you also uh, with your cardiovascular health. And if you provide access to reproductive health services, that's again in countries with a lot of uh, frequently following birth, you get better health of mothers and children. So that is, the health co-benefits are many, and they accrue either to the entire population through policy or to an individual through change behavior. And 
is it true or is the guy just making it up now to have a presentation? And um, we had a, with uh, Annelise from the Centre Virchaux Villermé in Paris, we had a study from 1992, which was the beginning of IPCC and the Rio conference. In fact, IPCC was 1991. Uh, it was a real conference. Till today, what is the EU legislation? And there are databases where you can search these uh, texts. And how often is health mentioned as an argument why we do this regulation and so forth? And about 50%, as you see, of in 50% of any regulation that is binding for member states, health is invoked as an argument. And the same, we are now doing an analysis of 99 countries, so it's not only in EU, 99 countries where we find exactly the same thing. So um, it matters. So we should encourage policymakers to take the health argument up and should kind of uh, confront them with this argument uh, time and again. Does individual household behavior matter? Yes. More than 50% of emissions are under your control and my control at home. So we should not always look at cement industry, car industry, um, energy generation, although uh, uh, we will hear more about this later, but not only, but we will also see that three fingers are pointing back to you, to us. So uh, it's an enormous amount of uh, consumption, 65 options. We will go into this uh, in detail with uh, Dorothee's and Alina's presentation later. What made the situation be in low and middle income countries? This study is from Europe. We will we show you this. He just left the room. Andy, this is uh, a work by Andy Haynes, which shows that even in Delhi, it's not only in London, when you, uh, when you change Active to active travel, these are the health benefits that they have modeled in terms of death and um, disease burden, ischemic heart disease, what I just said. So we can uh, count to, we can expect to uh, reap enormous health benefits. So this is my, my, my conclusions. Health co benefits are immediate, substantial, and um, for individuals as well as for, publication, for uh, populations. Let's use this as a positive climate change argument in the health argument in climate policy. Let's influence climate policy and let's influence our own behavior and that of our neighbor. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Rainer. Um, we will actually, unless you have a very uh, urgent question on understanding would actually put the questions to the end. Um, so then I would uh, ask Annelie Depoux. She is um, a co-director of the Centre Virchaux Villermé. It's a center for public health uh, between Berlin and Paris. And um, she will now talk about uh, the communication of climate change. Mm -hmm. You can say a few words about yourself if you want to, it's uh, until the slides are there. <laughs> Thank you. So. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so. So. <laughs> So the, the World Health Organization referred to the COP21 as a historic win for human health. And as Rainer Sauerman said, so health is the human face of climate change. Um, and the purpose of this talk is firstly to present uh, how health gained more visibility in the climate uh, debate and the negotiations. Um, the mobilization of the public health scientific community uh, has had a tangible impact uh, on the policy process and pushing for a greater integration of health concerns in climate policies needs to remain a priority, but so does the need to frame uh, climate as a public health issue in the public area 
to empower people and yes communication is a is essential to trigger a response to climate change that's uh, what uh, we will see uh, secondly thank you for the slides <laughs> Um, so let me tell about how the health gain more and more visibility uh, in climate debate. Uh, you can see here a timeline uh, going from the world first climate conference to COP21, and the road has been long to the Paris Agreement. United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed in 1992 uh, and was followed three years later by the first conference of the parties. The Kyoto Protocol was signed uh, but entered in force only eight years later. These elements are, are really setting the framework for advancing uh, the negotiation on climate. But health wasn't associated uh, with it in the beginning. In the uh, 80, only a few researchers have uh, studied the impacts of climate change on health. Paul Epstein related in his book, Changing Planet, Changing Health, that when he attended a climate conference in 1992, climatologists were surprised uh, to see a medical doctor there. So even for climate scientists, the impact of climate change on health weren't not obvious. But a lot of research has been done to demonstrate the impact of climate change and health, and the advancement of climate change and health research was shown by the inter intergovernmental uh, panel of climate change. Health is mentioned in the first assessment report in 1990, and already since 1995, second report of the IPCC, health is given its very own chapter um, in the reports of 2001 and 2007 benefits from larger chapters. So as uh, um, Rainer Soberborn uh, mentioned, uh, health uh, is mentioned in um, uh, so in the in a Centre Virchow-Villermé article published in 2016. Uh, 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 in Global Health Action, the authors observed a train of mainstreaming health in the debate of climate change impacts, indicating that in recent IPCC reports, more mentions of health came from non-health chapters. The years 2000 were crucial for the emergence of the World Health Organization as a leader in this area, especially the adoption of 2008 of a resolution on climate change and health, which gives a framework for action to governments. The resolution uh, emphasizes the health sector's responsibility uh, to increase efforts on climate change adaptation projects, to raise awareness on climate change and health impacts at national and international levels, as well as to strengthen uh, political attention and awareness. But the shift was really observed at COP21 in Paris, where the global health community was more visible and active than at in any COP, with various side events underlining the importance of health concerns related to climate change. For instance, during the Climate and Health Summit at COP21, over 1,700 health organizations, 8,000 hospitals and health fa facilities, and 13 million health professionals were representing and signatories, and called on governments to reach a strong agreement that would protect the health of patients and communities. This had never been done before and brought the global medical consensus on climate change to a new level. This increased engagement of the health community resulted in the inclusion of some wording related to health in the text of the Paris Agreement. The right to health was mentioned in the preamble of the text. 
So where did we go from there? Um, in Marrakesh at COP22, um, was, health was really a central topic and over 2,000 high-level officials from the health and the environmental sector signed up to the declaration of uh, for health, environmental, environment, and climate change. The goal is to re reduce pollution-related deaths via a new global initiative. The declaration encourages the health and envi environmental sectors to exchange experiences, technical expertise, and best practices to enhance health and protect the environment. World Health Organization has also actively promoted the health argument, for instance, by the Breast Life campaign of, the, of by organizing the second climate change and health summit. It is, of course, not possible um, uh, to not talk about the U.S. withdrawal, withdrawal from the Paris Agreement, and this is obviously a setback, but. Um, uh, it gave also the opportunity to other countries to take a stand. Uh, for instance, in uh, France, Emmanuel Macron launched the initiative Make a Planet Great Again. Uh, and more than um, uh, 250 applications were received, and we will know in January if health scientists uh, are among them. Um, so there is now an urgent need to advance a more concrete and systematic approach to implement health protection led by the health community in coordination with other fields. A more global approach is needed. The framing of these challenges is also crucial. Uh, this leads me to the second point of my presentation. So a key challenge that public health needs to address is communication. How can we communicate effectively prevention messages? How can we make sure that people adopt the right behavior to, pre to protect their health? Like public health, uh, climate change is a global issue that requires effective communication. This is the reason why we have taken up this challenge at the Centre Virchaux Villermé and created a research group for the health to study uh, the communication of climate change and health. Uh, for the health seeks to bring a European approach on this issue. US-based colleagues at the FORSI at George Mason University or her TL program on climate communication have shown that public health was a key argument to raise awareness about the impact of climate change. Framing climate change as a public health concern rather than as an environmental issue is one of the elements that can help better involve the public in engaging with climate change. And some articles uh, show that a public health framing is more likely to lead to positive engagement and positioning towards climate change issue. So far, FORCIEL has already produced uh, four landmark reviews. These reviews assess the state of our current knowledge about the impacts of climate change on health. They look at the scientific literature, the evolution of legislation, the media coverage, and finally, the state of educational programs for professionals. So, a leading voice uh, in Europe, newspapers, um, has been uh, the Guardians, which has raised the awareness of its readers on the issue uh, since 2013. It has been a real editorial decision from the editor, but this remains a rather isolated, albeit rem remarkable, initiative. For example, look uh, at our analysis of the coverage in Le Monde, uh, France's leading broadsheet. The three decade long analysis did not show any significant uh, increase in interest in the health aspect of climate change by, con by contrast to The Guardian. There has been, however, an evolution of the reporting on the subject. 
the green curve on the screen represents all articles published in Le Monde since 1990 that contain the term climate change. Then we count in the articles linking up climate change, climate change and health, and this is shown in the blue uh, on the graph. Through the health are mentioned only in a minority of articles reporting on climate change, the issue has clearly gained preeminence sin since 2000. It uh, was mostly addressed through articles on extreme events, infectious disease, migration, and malnutrition. On the media, pigs are actively, are typically, pigs are a sorry, of activity uh, are typically related to the UNFCC's conferences of the parties or COP. Such major events clearly drive peaks in media coverage. Uh, the steadiness of the press coverage of the Nexus contrasts with the sharp increase that we observed in the scientific literature through research has increased considerably expanded on the issue, and the media don't talk more about it than before. So this is a key issue. We need to again engage um, with people more actively. People continue to perceive climate change mostly as an environmental uh, issue, as a distance threat. There is a deep psychological distance with regard to geography, the impacts appear far away. Time horizon, uh, they are perceived as a future threat, but also with regard to social classes, people, they, leave, they will not be affected themselves. So we need to reduce the social distance uh, between the people and the victims of climate change and show people how climate change will also affect affect them. This is why health can be a very powerful uh, to, uh, to reduce this social dis distance and make people feel more concerned about climate change and its impacts for themselves uh, as well as for the other. Um, so I will, <laughs> do, uh, I will go forward. I think I have uh, two. One minute, okay. So, um, uh, uh, yes. Uh, so, communication uh, has an essential role uh, to play in provoking a response to climate change, and it must first raise awareness, make people feel involved, and ultimately engage them to take action. To achieve our public health goals, it is important to find out what kinds of messages about climate change are motivating. And I will uh, yes, so just have a look uh, on the key challenge to overcome. Uh, so climate change uh, appears as a very complex issue at the intersection of science and politics. So achieving clar clarity is a key. Um, we have to consider the principle of uh, proximity um, and people often uh, feel powerless in the face of climate change so negative messages uh, can use anxiety and apathy and finally so uh, it is important to show uh, people how to act collectively and not just individually collective uh, choices matter uh, um, more than individual behaviors. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now um, as individual and collective action matters, we will um, now rather hear about a collective issue. And um, Stefan Savarese, who is the co-director of Suvor Le Climat, but also a director of other NGOs such as um, Save the Planet, um, we welcome you very much and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. So I'm, I'm very pleased to address um, this issue in 10 minutes, which is um, which will be uh, basically the effects of climate change causes on health. And I'll show how it is related 
uh, to climate change its uh, effects themselves on health. So we, this is about. Um, okay, so Sauvons Climat is a Paris-based NGO, and we've been dealing with climate change since 2005, when people really didn't really believe it would happen, or maybe it's not true, or maybe... Okay, this is over now. I think we understand that climate change is here, that it already has impact on our day-to-day -day life, uh, but those impacts are increasing fast, and now we, we can see uh, already uh, the effect on health, so I'm re very glad that my colleagues are here to talk about it because I, it's not my specialty. And I will just uh, try to uh, get a few points across uh, on um, the, 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 first, um, the first impact, which is uh, health risks in Europe due to uh, the, the uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, also the pollution from uh, fossil fuels. So the main cause of fossil fuel has been, uh, of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, sorry, has been identified as fossil fuel, fossil fuel burning. And among those causes, the most important uh, in Europe and elsewhere in the world is uh, coal. Uh, coal burning produces about um, a quarter let's say 25, 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions, and it also produces uh, particulate matter uh, pollution. So it is responsible for about 30% of air pollution. And this, um, this is a concern because as you can see on the map, which represents the, the concentration of um, health risks, risks due to um, coal, coal power plants, uh, you can see that uh, some countries have avoided the risk either because they have uh, lower energy consumption or because they have switched to other sorts of um, power generation. And um, so th this, uh, just a few words about this study. This study is External E. It's an ongoing uh, European project. So there, there are several results, 2005, 2010. And I'm going to, to base my talk on results produced in 2013 by U the University of, of Stuttgart. And the methodology that, he, that they've used is shown in the right-hand side picture. On this picture, you have the effect of a single power, uh, power plant, uh, here it's Datton, on um, the, the health of the surrounding regions. Uh, I don't know if you can see the, the pixels. They, they are 15, 50 kilometer squared pixels. Uh, so in, in each of the 50 kilometer squared regions, the population and risks, health, health risks have been uh, evaluated, and then the color shows uh, the intensity of the health risk. So red is high intensity, green is low intensity. Of course, far away from the coal power plant, you have a low impact, and in less populated area, you have a lower impact because there are less people that can get sick. And uh, this is the result for one plant. Now, if you take all the power plants, and there are hundreds of them, and you add up the results over Europe, then you get the left-hand side picture. Uh, so th this is a more tricky uh, figure. I won't comment on this, I don't have time, but basically it's a way to represent using uh, circles, the, the earth risks country by country. Uh, the, the next slide uh, really shows the, the health risk types. So why do coal power plants induce risk? Uh, it's because they emit three kinds of pollutants. So one is gonna be CO2 and GHG, uh, which are not a direct health, health risk, but, but, but we, which are the causes of the main causes of climate change. The second are chemical pollutants, which, which can be acids or uh, metals or various kinds of compounds. And these have a direct impact on health because they are, they are toxic chemicals. And then you have the particulate matter, which, has, uh, which are part of the air pollution and which have a respiratory uh, disease impact and lung defects and even lung can cancer effect. Um, and, and then you have also um, two factors that, that, that can um, that are important, that these coal power plants are not evenly distributed. So, so this, this is the power of by country by country. So you see, you see that Germany, Poland, the UK 
are the, are the main coal power, uh, power uh, producer. And then you have, but, but for smaller countries like Italy or Spain, you see that compared to their uh, power needs, they, already, they also have uh, strong dependency on coal power. So this makes the problem difficult. You have the, the numbers on the right, uh, which, which I'm going to read. So we have, we have approximately 300 uh, coal power plants, and you have the numbers on the right which show uh, that this is not uh, an, eligi an eligible problem. It's very hard to get out of coal because it's so important. So uh, the first kind of risk are the old power plants. So they, they, um, they, are, they, they are the, we could say, the dirtiest power plants because they, they, they were built a long time ago when pollution was not the issue. It's when Europe needed the maximum power it could get from coal. And so the, that problem hasn't been treated pro properly. So in countries like Germany, the, the, most of the, of the power, coal power plants have been uh, depolluted. So we call that denox, desox. Basically, they emit less nitrous oxides and sulfur oxides, so less acid rains. Um, but regarding the other kinds of pollutants, which are CO2, particulate matter, and metals, there is hardly anything you can do. It's, it's almost impossible to get rid of them. So when you, when you hear that we have newer, cleaner power plants and we have depolluted, it is true only for the acid rains. It doesn't concern the other kinds of pollutants. So uh, basically, the problem is half treated in Germany and not treated in other countries. Um, so the second problem is the new power plants. So there are 50 new power plants which are um, projected in the next, to be built in the next 10 years. Uh, in Germany, there is only one, it's Dutton Fear, um, but, but there are 12 more power plants to build. And this is what you have to build if you want a nuclear exit. So if you want less nuclear power, you're gonna have more coal power. And this is a little known fact. Uh, so the question is, wh what if we stop the construction of those 50 power plants, what are we going to build instead? And there is no simple answer to that. So the, the numbers are really appalling. You, you see that you have thousands of uh, people, lives which are at risk, and it's important for Europe to stop the construction of those power plants. Um, so. So in, basically, these are the four uh, different kind of risks, uh, which are the GHGs and black carbon, the toxic chemicals, the particle suit, uh, which, which, which we call air particle pollution, and the radioactivity, which is another little known fact that coal is producing more radioactivity than nuclear plants. So if you are really worried about radioactivity, you should stop coal power plants before the nuclear power plants. And the good news is that in both cases, in fact, the radioactivity quantities and doses are so small that you don't really care. But if you're really worried about radioactivity, you should not close nuclear power plants first. You should close your coal power plants first. Um, so I will pass quickly on the, on the next slides. They show basically, basically the list of the nasty chemicals that are emitted by, by coal power plants. Two minutes. Yes. And, um, and this, this is, um, all right, so I'll go to the conclusion right away. Or maybe this one is important because it shows the numbers. So these are the results. Um, of um, death and morbidity, so that, that's, that's the illness, serious illness and the minor illness caused by each terawatt hour of power produced, depending on the energy source. So you see that the worst are lignite and coal, and then you have also uh, oil, and, uh, and then the other, the other ones are much lower. So, so you see basically what you have to stop first is basically coal and oil. And then once you have stopped that, you can worry about the rest. But it doesn't make sense to say, I'm gonna stop everything because you can't. And if you start closing coal power plants and lignite power plants, you already have a big problem. And it's very hard to reduce coal and natural gas after that. And it's even harder if you, if you want to shut down nuclear power plants. So this is 
this is to put things in perspective, then, then you can say, okay, but the, we have the local and the global pollution. What about the global pollution? Well, the global pollution is that CO2 is shared everywhere, and the other pollutants, they have an extent of 500 to 1,500 kilometers. So basically, if you build a power plant, it doesn't matter just for your country in Europe. It matters also for the neighboring countries because you're going to pollute uh, a pollution dot, which is about 500 to 1,500 kilometers wide. Um, so that's about the same picture. Okay, this one is interesting. Okay, there is also an impact in terms of uh, days of work loss and also uh, years of last life lost. And just in Germany, you have the numbers, it's not negligible. So even though the Germany has depolluted, it, depolluted its carbon power plants, there is still a strong impact. Uh, so you could say, oh, but the, this, we are just looking at one tiny part of the problem. What about the whole picture? Of course, it would not make any sense for us to look at coal power plants if uh, a systematic, uh, holistic approach was proving that, in fact, it's just a small part. But, um, but in fact, those studies have been undertaken in the, within the wider framework of holistic and systemic approaches, which are consistent. In the, they are consistent, which means that the holistic approach confirms what the uh, specialized approach has revealed. Uh, and so what is the connection with uh, climate change? Well, uh, they are related because the, the nice thing with, uh, with, uh, with uh, reducing fossil fuels is that it also helps uh, not only Im health impact, but also climate change impact. And it's very important for everyone to understand that we need to stick to the 1.5 degree target, not the two degree, because you have the slopes here, and the slopes, uh, the slopes of the risk really are, um, are not sustainable when you approach two degrees. So in fact, the, the, even though the Paris Agreement says that two degrees would be okay, in fact, 1.5 degrees is okay, and two degrees is really bad. And anything beyond that is too bad. So uh, we're coming to my conclusion. Uh, we've been saying this for a couple of years, and we are glad that uh, many NGOs are now understanding that coal exit is a priority. We have a petition with, with the link at the bottom, which is exitcoalnow.org. Please sign it. And uh, be, why? Because we need uh, people and leaders of the world to understand that this is an important issue. Otherwise, there won't be enough people supporting a coal exit, and we'll still have the problems 10 or 20 years from now. But now you have the information, and it's time to act. So please do so. Thank you, Stefan. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for this view on um, how health is affected um, by the industry level. Now I have to introduce uh, Alina because she gives a talk. Alina Hermann is uh, a junior scientist for all the young people in the room. Uh, she's still a doctoral student, so please join uh, also as a young scientist. And uh, she will uh, introduce a study that we did in Heidelberg. And then there's somebody waiting on Skype who will continue um, that um, thread of arguments. Alina, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you, Rainer. So um, actually, this will be a combined talk. So I will, um, exp or I will give you uh, an introduction into our research project, which was focusing on household consumption. Um, and then my colleague, Dorothy, um, who's with us on Skype, she will give you the details about the health aspect. So although I'm a medical doctor, please don't expect anything on health from my side. That will come later on. So, um, no, four, it's okay. So it's, pre four. Okay. So um, our project um, is called HOPE, and it stands for Household Preferences for Reducing Greenhouse Gas Emissions in Four European High-Income Countries. So um, following the principles of convergence, of course, if we look at household consumption, first of all, the focus is on high-income countries because um, their carbon footprint 
um, is a lot higher per capita than it is in low and middle income countries. So um, I think we are the first um, who look at uh, whom to look at um, if we look at um, green behavior. So we have conducted our study in Norway, Sweden, France, and Germany. And um, our assumptions, you have already heard from Rainer, that of course we want to stick to the 1.5 degree goal, and if households are responsible for over 50% of greenhouse gas emissions, then of course there is a need also for households to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So what did we do? I will run you quickly um, throughout our um, survey. Um, basically, this survey had three steps. So the first step was that we assessed carbon footprint of households in a um, questionnaire. Um, so we measured households' carbon footprint in four areas, mobility, food, housing, and other consumption. Then we visited households on site. Um, and we did a simulation with them. So we came with a tool uh, including their household carbon footprint and then we gave them um, a list of 65 mitigation actions in the four areas of food, housing, mobility and other consumption. And this was presented on action cards. These cards um, would contain, for example, shift to a green electricity provider or um, use your um, bike and uh, bike and walk more. So these kind of actions. And people could choose those actions first in a voluntary round. And then it would, um, the tool that we had would come up with the carbon reduction of their footprint. So um, if, and if people uh, wouldn't have reached a 50% reduction of their carbon footprint by choosing actions voluntarily, they actually entered into a next round. So let's say someone reduced by 23% his household carbon footprint um, in that first round by choosing actions he would like to implement. Then in the next round, he would have to um, choose as many actions more until he reached a reduction by 50%. So you will, I will show examples of results uh, on this later on. That was the second step of our survey. And then the third step um, were qualitative interviews with a subsample of households where we actually wanted to find out about um, the motivations and also barriers for people to act and also about their health perceptions. So I will only give you a short overview about our results. So what you can see here is um, the carbon footprint per consumption unit, with, which is similar to per capita, um, of our household sample in the four areas of mobility, food, housing, and other consumption. And the three columns you can see in each of the sectors show first the, carbon, the initial carbon footprint of the household, second, the carbon footprint after the voluntary round of reducing the carbon footprint, and third, the um, carbon footprint after the fourth round. And what I only want to draw your attention to one thing, and this is that if you look at the food column, you can see that people reduced like the 50% reduction in the food sector was much more re uh, reached in the voluntary round, whereas you can see that the reduction in the mobility sector was basically only reached in the fourth round. So that's actually one um, of our findings that measures in the food sector, people were, um, had a greater stated willingness to implement these actions than in the mobility sector. So I will only give you two quotes to illustrate um, this and what could motivate people to choose this way. So first, there's a quotation on food that I'd like to read out to you. So there's, um, it was a female interview from Germany. Um, she was 48 years old and she said, so for one thing, I want to support organic farming because I want to know what the food contains that I eat. If I buy milk or cheese, I want that the animals were kept properly. And what is also important for me is that the people who are part of the production earn proper money. And therefore, I find it okay if such food has its price. So this just as a general example, how maybe food 
is, can be acceptable. Then here's a quotation on mobility, maybe just to show why the mobility sector is more problematic. So this is a um, male interviewer with, who has actually three children, aged between 10 and 13. He says, at the moment, it is very important to have a semester abroad in your CV. I think in the companies you think, hey, this guy is motivated, he wants to learn, he's flexible, he's been to the US for a year. It sounds better than saying, oh well, yes, this guy is organic, he's climate friendly, he decided to stay at home and not pollute the air. So you can see there are some issues in the mobility sector. Then, of course, uh, there's one more thing we did in our study, which is um, a policy analysis. So we analyzed the policies related to household consumption in our four countries. And what we found, of course, is that in general, there you have two approaches. Um, they're also referred to as carrot and stick, but if you want to uh, put it um, in a more uh, proper way, you say you have command and control measures, uh, which would be the stick, and market-oriented measure measures, would, which, which would be the carrot. And um, we found that in between the sectors, actually the policy approaches um, are differently used. So in the housing sector, you have quite a few command and control measures, whereas um, in the food sector, so far, the measures are largely market oriented. And in the mobility sector, um, you have a few of both. In aviation, it's totally market oriented, for example. In car uh, use, you could see quite a difference between France and Germany, which had rather market oriented measures, and then Norway and Sweden, where quite a few command and control measures were in place already. So um, what can we learn from this? Um, generally, households are key actors in climate change mitigation. Then you could also see that the households are actually willing to change, but at least under the current um, policy approaches and the situation as it is, um, the voluntary reduction of households would definitely not suffice to reach the 1.5 degree goal. And then we can also say that we have both um, command and control, so carrot, oh, sorry, stick, and also market oriented, so rather um, carrot measures. But we definitely need more from both of them. And I think we can also see from our study that, uh, especially in areas of general high acceptability, um, command and control measures might be more acceptable. Uh, so we think that we can implement more of the, these measures, especially in sectors such as food. And now, uh, because this is a health event, of course we come to the key question, which is what is the role of the health argument in households' preferences for mitigation action? And therefore, I would like to give to my colleague Dorothy, who could not join us today, but who's with us on Skype, and I do hope that it will work um, to have her give her presentation. Um, now I, thank you. Hello, Ted, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will just click, yeah. just tell me next slide. Uh, it's a title right. slide now. Okay, can I start? Yes. Is that the first slide already? Yes. Okay, brilliant. Okay, thank you for having me. Um, so I will um, address the question in this presentation of um, uh, whether we can actually use health as a motivator for climate change mitigation because we heard in the previous presentations a couple of times that we can use it as a motivator for, in, for individuals and that we can actually reduce the psychological distance um, of, uh, by using this health argument but 
Um, is there some empirical ground um, for that? If we provide people with additional information on health co benefits, does that actually make a difference for them? So, um, um, next slide, please. Yep. All right. Okay. So, why are we talking about health? Why do we think that health can be a motivator? for climate change mitigation for the individual. So we um, assume that there are three reasons for that. And um, there might be even more than that, but these are maybe the more, more important ones. And the first point is that um, if we are talking about individual health co-benefits, um, they are not contingent on other people's behavior. To, um, to join in. So they don't have to join in for the individual to reap the benefits of their behavior. So for example, if someone eats less red meat, um, this uh, individual can actually um, directly um, affect their cardiovascular health, for example. And that doesn't um, um, yeah, depend on other people's behavior. So whether your neighbor eats less meat is, is not really relevant for your individual health. So um, this can actually reduce the psychological um, distance that Annelise was already talking about. Um, so uh, conversely also that the individual, in order to receive these health co-benefits and reap the benefits of them, um, the individual cannot free ride. So um, for example, if you're talking about air pollution um, and if we uh, want to reduce the air pollution, then obviously this is a common good that everyone needs to contribute to so that everyone can actually um, reap the benefits of that. Um, but um, so individuals can actually um, choose not to contribute to that and can still free ride on the actions of others if a substantial amount of other people will contribute to this common good. So that's not the kinds of health co-benefits that we are talking about here in our study um, because we want to really um, reap the benefit of the individual health benefits. The second point um, that is also important is that the evidence base for health benefits is well established. We already heard about this in, in, previous, uh, in previous presentations, so um, I don't have to talk a lot about this. So we can actually um, say um, something about the magnitude of health benefits and we can use that um, in, in our communication. And the third point is that the idea of a healthy lifestyle is much more ingrained in public discourse than um, the idea of a climate friendly health uh, lifestyle. You can already see that, like, like for example, with your neighbor, you probably are not talking that much about climate change, but you are talking about your health. That's much more uh, an issue that is closer, closer to the individual and closer to the self. Next slide, please. So um, we are talking about health as a motivator for mitigation, which is not a new idea. So there is actually previous research on that, um, which, however, yielded um, mixed results. But our argument here is that previous research did not account for the collective action problem. That's what I was talking about um, a couple of minutes before, that um, we are focusing on individual health benefits, whereas in previous um, research, for example, participants were confronted with statements such as um, using cleaner forms of energy such as solar and wind power will reduce air and water pollution, thereby preventing many forms of illness, which does not um, allude in any way to uh, individual effects, like effects on the individual. So, and it's very abstract. Um, and so there are mixed results on whether this kind, these kinds of statements do actually make a difference for people. And um, so our argument is that we, these, this, these previous um, studies could not really differentiate, um, could not really say if it is the health argument that was or was not um, um, uh, convincing for participants or whether um, participants just did not want to invest in a common public good. So that's, that's a huge difference. So um, our study definitely focused on individual health effects. So um, next slide, please. 
uh, for this particular um, part of the study, what we did is we um, actually did have an, um, an experimental setup. So we had an experimental group and a control group, um, and half of our participating households received additional information on health co benefits. You can see that on these action cards that Alina was already talking about. So we gave participants these 65 options, or at least the options that were actually feasible for them. And um, for, the, for the experimental group, um, you can see that there was an additional box next to the carbon reduction, the likely carbon reduction they could achieve with this option. Um, uh, there was an additional op and, and on um, cost, that was the, the, the second criterion they could um, decide on. And there was a third box um, talking about health benefits. And it was really a very small and subtle intervention in that we only gave them like like plus signs or minus signs, basically telling them if they would actually um, be able to reap uh, um, a small, a medium size or a bigger um, co-benefit from um, picking this option for their health. Um, and the control group did not receive any information on that, on, on this on these health co-benefits. So what we asked ourselves then, does that make a difference on the, the, the participants' stated willingness to actually reduce um, their carbon footprint in the sectors, um, mobility, housing, and um, food? And what we also asked ourselves is, does that also make a difference for the actual carbon reductions they achieved in the voluntary round? Next slide, please. So um, on this slide, you can um, see the effect on the stated willingness to mitigate of participants. And um, these are the results of a regression analysis where we um, saw, uh, looked into whether the health information did make a difference between control and experimental group uh, with regard to their stated willingness. Stated willingness means that we simply asked participants to um, tell us whether they were willing to pick the particular action or not. One would mean um, not at all willing, five would mean very willing, and then we averaged that um, for each sector. And we could find here that households who, which, which um, received additional information on health co benefits, they were more willing to mitigate actually in the food and housing sectors, but not in the mobility sector. Next slide, please. So we also looked into um, whether this actually made a difference for the actual carbon reductions that households did achieve, um, because obviously if, if it's only the stated willingness, that's all well and good, but um, if that doesn't make a difference for their carbon footprints, then it's, it's not really that useful maybe. So um, did they achieve um, carbon reductions as well? Um, and here we can see that's also a regression um, uh, results show us that households which received additional information on their health co-benefits, they achieved an actual higher carbon reduction in the food sector, but not in the other sectors. For mobility, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't expect that because the willingness to um, reduce wasn't higher with the health information as well. But um, for the housing sector, it is a little bit surprising that there um, we couldn't find uh, an actual carbon reduction. So what we looked at into was the um, carbon reduction potential that these sectors actually had. Next slide, please. So um, we looked into um, to see if the carbon reduction potentials for the available measures um, of the households on average were actually high enough that we could find an actual carbon reduction because um, not all of the uh, 65 mitigation measures were feasible and available to um, households for example because they already did it um, and also one of the same mitigation measure yielded different CO2 reductions for different households because they were dependent on, on the other actions. So, um, um, so we looked into um, differences in, uh, between the sectors in, in terms of their carbon reduction potentials and we saw actual differences there. Um, so while the available mobility actions 
um, certainly had significant reduction potential on average for the households in our sample. Um, this was absolutely not the, the case for the housing options. So this is possibly the reason why we did not find an effect um, on um, actual carbon reductions in the housing sector. Next slide, please. So in this slide, we see um, what did we find in sum? Um, what does that mean now? So um, we provided half of our participating households with information on health care benefits and looked into whether this was making a difference for their stated willingness um, to actually reduce their carbon footprint in the sector's food, housing and mobility. And we also looked into whether this actually translates into actual carbon reductions. And um, what we found is that the additional information on health care benefits did make a difference for food and housing options and that health information did enhance the um, the willingness to reduce in these sectors. Um, and this actually did also translate in actual carbon reduction um, for the food options, but not in the other sectors. For mobility, this was not surprising because um, the stated willingness wasn't higher for that sector anyways. And um, for housing, this was a little bit surprising, but could be potentially because the carbon reduction potential wasn't that high in the first place. So um, yes, can we use health as a motivator for climate change mitigation? And it seems um, based on these results that yes, in principle, our results point to that direction that if we're talking about individual health care benefits, not the collective ones, then yes, it seems that it can be an effective motivator. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doro. Okay, so um, now these were all of our talks. Um, we have actually 20 minutes left for questions and discussions. So um, I would like to open the floor now to you. And please, if you have a specific speaker that you would like to direct your question on, just say so. But you can also pose a question for the panel and we will see who can answer. Okay. Hello, hi, I'm Adi, I'm from uh, Tel Aviv University, and I would like to ask you as uh, faculty members and uh, university members, are you advancing uh, environmental agendas and policies in, uh, in, in your university? Um, maybe Rainer, do you want to? Um, this is why I put also my second affiliation, because uh, Harvard University does an enormous job. They have an office for this. They, have, they are better than the climate goals uh, of uh, the UNFCCC. They really uh, have a carbon footprint monitor and so forth. Heidelberg University is disaster, unfortunately, I have to say. Um, so uh, it, is, it varies. And um, you only ask uh, regarding university itself. You didn't ask about, OK, that was the answer that I can give. I don't know if you have. Uh, in, yes. Uh, do, do you, as a university, and you're also part of Université Paris Descartes, uh, do you monitor your own footprint? And do you have measures that reduce it? Sorry. I think it's the same uh, as the University of Heidelberg. <laughs> it's a pity. <laughs> Can I ask Andy, maybe? Andy, um, I wanted to, Andy Haynes of London School, I wanted to acknowledge first that there was a participation, a strong participation, particularly in the health uh, domain by the London School, by Paul Wilkinson. They could not be full partners because of budget EU arcane rules, but they provided, Paul Wilkinson provided the spreadsheet for the health co benefits. So uh, I wanted to acknowledge it because it didn't appear on any of the slides. And because Andy has the microphone as a former <laughs> dean at the London School. <laughs> so, well, th thanks very much for a really interesting presentation. So I, I'd like to direct my question to you, Alina, or to Dorothy, because I was very interested in the mo mobility results. And I wonder if some of the negative effects is because you didn't differentiate between those people who could change their mobility patterns. In other words, if you live in a city, 
you don't have to drive your car, you could use a bus or you could cycle. But if you have to commute 30 kilometers or something, then it's going to be very, very difficult. So I wondered if you had stratified people into those that could potentially change quite easily and those that couldn't, whether you would have got a different result. And I wonder if you thought about doing that. Because the mobility, uh, the transport sector is a very important sector, of course, for, for greenhouse gas emissions. So we need to get better policies. Okay, so um, I will, uh, I don't know if Doro has understood the question, did you? Uh, could you hear it? Yeah, so maybe you want to answer on it? Or, but I um, could also, yeah, okay. Yes, absolutely, very good question, actually. Um, we, um, what I can say is that we um, also put location of the household as a covariate into our regression analysis, and it turns out that uh, the more centrally located um, participants participating households were that the higher was the willingness to actually change their mobility behavior on average. So um, that definitely is is a contributor, yes. Um, and maybe, <clears throat> um, maybe I can just add to that. So, um, I mean, this is basically ongoing research, so we have not uh, fin uh, at least for example, we have not finished to, um, to include the qualitative results, um, also into explaining maybe our quantitative results. Um, but one thing, maybe it could also be that generally, um, because people were more unfavorable towards mobility actions, so maybe this, like, because it is, uh, maybe the convenience argument counts so much more that the health argument is then not strong enough to convince them. So that's that would only be. A, um, uh, a suggestion. Of course, we can't prove that from the data, but maybe just as an idea. Hi. Um, Fabian Minish from Lund University. Thank you so much for being here at this late hour. Um, I made it as well after a long day at IRENA, uh, Renewable Energy Day. I have a question that relates back to the second speaker. Um, I will not attempt to say your name. I think I'd mispronounce. Um, but you said, well, you, you quoted a paper talking about public health framing um, leading to or being more likely to lead to climate friendly behavior or actions. And I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on what precisely they looked into and whether that maybe was in line with what you found in your study. Is that clear? <laughs> so the, sem the Myers Sorry. paper, what, mm. what was it in detail? Did it come on detail? Mm. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> um, so. Um, hmm. Did you understand the question? Should you rephrase it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Can you just rephrase your question once more? Um, I'll try. So <laughs> maybe in French. <laughs> <laughs> I can try in German or Spanish, but French will be difficult. Um, you you quoted a paper that said that framing yeah. climate change as a public health or health issue in general leads to more climate friendly action. I'm not really rephrasing, just repeating. Um, I realize. Um, so I was wondering what precisely they looked, they looked into. What type of behavior? What type of actions? whether it was also eating less meat or using the bicycle in, instead of cars. And in that sense, then, if that was in line with what um, the other two researchers from Heidelberg University found. Yes. So Is that so, clearer? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, uh, yes, they highlights, uh, I think, the, the potential increasing people's uh, engagement by framing the climate change issue in terms of health uh, instead of environmental risks uh, or national security. But uh, I don't know, uh, Reina, uh, you, you will probably. Well, these papers did not differentiate, as you, as you uh, ask, uh, what what portion? Is it food? Is it mobility? And so forth. Mm. So th it was a very gen general uh, paper, and it was not really based on empirical evidence. Mm. So it was uh, basically saying, well, um, usually people like health, mm. and uh, this is why one should frame uh, the climate change uh, problem in health terms. And it motivated us to really f try to get some empirical uh, data, and even to have a randomized controlled trial. Um, uh, that was basically because the literature was 
always stating it, but never really um, providing any any hard evidence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Does anybody else have a question? Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Ang Zhao from China. Uh, I work with a local think tank called uh, Rock Environment and Energy Institute. I'm really interested in what you have uh, shared with us. So my, my question is about the, uh, the rationale behind this uh, study. You know, uh, you said uh, we are, at least for OECD countries, uh, citizens are responsible for the 50% of the carbon emission from uh, the perspective of the cons con consumption. But which we, from my understanding, we have to uh, re re realize that there is a strong interaction between supply and the consumption. Sometimes, as you, Professor, you mentioned, you have no choice if you want to go low carbon lifestyle. So for OECD countries, uh, most infrastructure has been uh, built up. At least for in the recent time, you will not renew it uh, in a very big effort. You will continue to use that. So based on this, you, you can think about a lifestyle change. But for many other, uh, for, for most developing countries, they are still in a very rapid growth and design, planning, construction. If they don't really think about very smartly about this process, people will stuck in the uh, very, <laughs> very not, not easily to pursue their low carbon style. So, so I think you may th rethink the interaction interaction about, about these two forces, and this is uh, I think one question. I will get your comments. Uh, and secondly, so when you do the uh, health um, analysis as as a motivator. Um, people always think, okay, in the food sector, it's really easy to understand. It's really uh, very quick uh, benefits, very short. But in other uh, issues, for example, in the air pollution, and uh, people think, okay, I, I will not get lung cancer within maybe 10 years, 20 years. Should I do something help air uh, quality improvements? So that's a very uh, is is also very difficult to communicate to communicate with public. So I thought uh, I think maybe you can ha have a chance to share this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the first comment joins a little bit uh, the comment by by Andy Haynes in that um, one should maybe think more carefully about uh, the constraints that households have to, let's say, take a bike uh, or go on foot if, if you have to sh shuttle to your uh, job. And uh, particularly in countries where there are no bike lanes or where you just, if you live in Shanghai or so, you, you just, uh, uh, you cannot uh, jog or you cannot uh, be easy at, at uh, changing this type of lifestyle. You can may maybe change your diet. So uh, yes, we should think a little bit more more deeply, and we want to continue this research, and uh, we want to continue it particularly in uh, middle-income countries now. And we had a proposal which was unfortunately turned down uh, in Indonesia and in uh, Brazil. Uh, China would be an obvious uh, candidate, and I see that link between offer, I mean, what can people do from public infrastructure, and, and demand. Uh, so remind me of your second question, which was, um, the second question was well easy yeah 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 Yeah, that's exactly, um, that's a little bit uh, linked, of course. You're absolutely right. So one should uh, do a, a, a space, a solution space. One should really exclude things that are not really possible. And, and if we go into China or into uh, Indonesia or other uh, middle-income countries, this uh, solution space will, will be smaller certainly, and there will be other options, for example, and they, these options, you cannot really ask a, a housewife in Africa or in India, why don't you just uh, cook with uh, electricity? 
it's much it's much better for the climate. It, she has to their concerns there. They are, she cannot, for financial and for poverty reasons, just switch. So here comes supply. I mean, China did a wonderful job in getting rid of indoor air pollution. Um, uh, India is following suit uh, and so forth. So there will be other co-benefits to be reaped. And the, the indoor air pollution co-benefit is much larger than anything that we were looking at in our four countries. So I would be very interested in, in looking into this, uh, and that's the obvious next step in um, countries which have another solution space and have other huge health risks uh, that uh, can be avoided uh, as a co-benefit of, let's say, indoor better fuels uh, for cooking and better stoves. Thank you. And if I may also add to that. So, um, of course, we're also, I mean, this was also just a, um, like one piece of our results, but we're also looking at um, socioeconomic factors um, which um, may determine why people can choose certain measures and can't choose others. Or also, of course, in the qualitative interviews, um, looking at what is actually hindering people. And, and then, at the same time, looking into the policy. So, of course, all of this um, is very much interconnected. Um, so, I think we do, um, uh, we do try to um, show or look into this in our project as well. So. Thank you for that comment. Okay. Yes, uh, th there is another parameter, which is that uh, there, there can be price incentives. So some regulation could be introduced that um, will make unhealthy things uh, more expensive. Um, because the, the, but the problem is that the, the free market don't always have the mechanisms to do that. So, so if you if you think of sending the right price signal to the consumer, uh, because basically the the message has to be you have to consume right, better for your health and better for the climate, then we need to think on how to reshape the whole uh, tax system. Uh, today there are things which are taxed like uh, work output, which are not. Uh, uh, a problem for the climate, not for your health, but yet they are taxed. What if we could lower the tax on that and raise the tax on the health and climate risks? Then we would have a healthier financial system because we would have a tax system which increases tax on what is bad for your health and bad for the climate and reduces tax on what is good for society, which is your work output. Yeah, if I may add on this, so I actually just read an article. He was uh, from a um, person who is, uh, has worked on diabetes um, and obesity for a long time. And this article was not at all about climate, but it was about healthy diets. And it was about saying that the in, uh, approach of just informing people has been tried over decades now, and it basically didn't change anything. So I mean, now um, adding the argument that it's climate friendly and still only informing people will probably not make the change we need. So I do believe that, um, like, Actually, like we said, said, the carrot and stick measures, I do believe that um, especially in the um, area of food where you actually see that people are already willing to change something, but maybe it's just too hard for themselves to, to stick to this. So I do believe that there is actually room for uh, more strict policy measures that are still acceptable for households because they know it's actually good for them. So. I have a small question too. So um, do you think that, or I have a small question regarding to your uh, topic, health as a motivator of climate policy and green behavior, especially for green behavior. So do you think that um, a change, or if we, if we change the health insurance, especially in Germany, um, would, yeah, would um, force people or would uh, help people to change their behavior so do you think that if we would change the uh, health system they would adopt to uh, a greener behavior for example if we ask them um, yeah do you uh, smoke or do you eat a lot of meat or do you drive with your car a lot and stuff like that so that they have to pay a higher uh, a higher insurance 
Um, that's an interesting point, and it has been tried before. Um, if you ride a motorcycle, you have to pay more. Uh, if you are doing rock climbing, you have to pay more. Uh, it's an ethical issue. You basically, if you're if you're a beast, you have to pay more. If you're a smoker, you, if you're a woman, you have to pay more because statistically they consume more hair. And this is for for a, a equity-oriented policy unacceptable. You would basically. Um, punish people for, for their behavior, and that's not the right way to do it. Um, I would just want it, it, I hope this is, uh, I don't think that this is a good approach to, to use the health system. We will withdraw healthcare or we will uh, raise the premiums if you do this and that. Um, that's kind of too much of a, a stick, I would think. But I wanted to make one thing clear. We didn't mean to say the household's spontaneous just mentioning health would do wonders. We are going back to the EU and we are telling them households just stated their preferences. We did not prove, like nobody did, three years afterwards whether they really did it. So we have to take this, even the spontaneous reduction declaration with a grain of salt. And, and it, it shows basically that households need to be helped with public policy with better uh, bike, uh, bike uh, path, with infrastructure, with tax incentives, with subsidies. So I'm not at all trying to, to say, hey, we have the panacea, it is the household. And you just have to mention a health benefit and everything will be fine. We will say households are more likely to go on this front. You have to help them much more on the mobility front, for example. That will be our message when we have the, the feedback workshop in, in Brussels. And hopefully, they will, be, uh, they will listen that um, we Households need to be helped, and that's what Alina said also, by good infrastructure, by good incentives, and that's also what you said, the tax system and so forth. So it is a whole complex issue, and I didn't want to only uh, sort of focus on, we did focus on, uh, mainly on households, uh, but we didn't say this is the only uh, tool in our, only arrow in our quiver. It is one, but a forgotten one a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we're almost over with the time. Um, I don't know if we want to take a f one final question. Yeah, so with, so you haven't said anything, so maybe we take your question as a final one. Um, so um, I am also here to remind you that you're over the time. Hi, uh, Kit Moran from uh, Dalhousie University. Um, in one of the sessions today, there was a commenter who was talking about how some developing nations and smaller smaller nations have smaller governments. And one of the things that we you, you talked about was that uh, we need more command and control and also more market-based incentives. So it particularly quite true in uh, industrialized nations that have the capacity to do both. In these smaller countries with less government, is there, do you have a sense of which, if that still applies, that we need more of both, or should it, does it shift a little bit in one way or the other towards more market-based or more command and control? Thank you. Okay, thank you for this question. So first of all, I have to say that um, the policy analysis was done by colleagues so, and we worked only in high income countries. So basically to, to me, this would be very hard to answer. I don't know if Reiner, who has worked more in the low and middle income setting has more to say on this. <laughs> if you throw the ball back to me. Um, let's talk about in, very shortly about the, this cook stove and the indoor air pollution business. You would think, and there have been about 15,900 different models that were designed very cleverly and didn't work. So just by the supply side, um, if you don't have a government like the Chinese government who, who, who just say this is the model and this is what we will mass produce now, uh, which was very good for, for this, uh, this solution. But if you go to an African country or to India, this is not possible. And you have to talk to the women and you have to take their willingness, their preferences into account and then uh, come with a market-based what, what, uh, what have you, market-based, but then the pricing has to be right. You can't uh, ask for a stove that costs twice the yearly income of these people, or cash income. So I think here too, although in a, you have to understand the context very carefully, here too it is a meeting of what households think and what their preferences are and how you can help them 
uh, realize a, a solution to the problem that they suffer from uh, from doing something bad to the, they suffer health-wise by doing something bad to the climate as well. Yeah. Yeah, and ma maybe just one last comment, because there has been um, a few African countries who actually banned plastic bags, if you might have, or, um, might have heard. So um, they have some very strict command and control measures, which, which are very helpful. So, yeah. Okay, then uh, we're a few minutes over time. Thank you very much for joining us. And, uh, yeah, have a nice evening. <laughs>